Hi, in this video we're going to do a couple more examples from Section 2 of Module 3. Uh, these are good examples that uh, kind of illustrate what goes on generally with these loans. So let's get started with the first example. We got a, uh, a loan of $500,000 at an annual effective interest rate of 6% is repaid with annual payments. It says the first payment is $20,000 and subsequent payments are $5,000 more than their preceding payments determine the outstanding balance immediately after the 10th payment. So this one's a little bit more tricky, so we need a timeline on it. So, or, or I'll, I'll draw a timeline here. Uh, so this is what our timeline looks like. And I'm looking for the outstanding balance immediately after the 10th payment. Um, I'm not real sure. It, it, at this point, you know, I'll just start with first payment of 20,000. Next payment at time two would be 25,000. Uh, you probably don't actually have to get the amount of the payment at time 10, but if you follow that pattern, you'll see that the payment at time 10 would actually be 65000 And uh, what I want is the balance uh, just after that payment, just after that payment at time 10. Okay, before I get to the problem, let me make a comment about what's going on here. And notice the payments are increasing substantially. And so uh, the comment I'm about to make is, is sometimes... Uh, um, it's, it's kind of common with this type of problem where the payments are increasing substantially. Uh, so here's the comment. What, let's, let, let, I want to ask, what's the first, uh, what is the amount of interest that would be owed at time one? So what if that was the question? How much interest um, is, is uh, um, how much interest is owed at time one? Well, to get the amount of interest at time one, you look at the balance at time zero, which is the, fi the 500,000, and you multiply that by the uh, interest rate, the, the periodic effective interest rate, the AEIR, in this case 6%, you'll see that that's $30,000. But notice that the actual amount of the payment is only $20,000. So you're not even paying enough. That first payment of $20,000 is not enough to pay the amount of interest. Uh, and you go through the, the process, the subtract the cap I value from the, from the payment, cap C value, and you get a negative $10,000. In other words, the amount of principal repaid is a negative 10,000. Um, and they're not just going to let you go on that payment. And they're not going to say, oh, well, you, you know, that's okay. Don't worry about the, the other 10,000. No, of course, what they're going to do is they're going to say, well, we're going to add that, um, add the deficiency there to the, uh, to the loan amount. So your balance at time one is now going to be actually 510,000. You're in, at this point, you're in what's called a negative amortization. Negative amortization means that your payment amount was not even enough to pay your interest. So they rolled the, the, the difference there into, the, they added that to your balance, and your balance is actually going up. So that's a negative amortization. So at time one, your balance at time one is actually 510000 and then we could uh, go through and find the balance at time two. I could do the same thing, or I could just use this other process of finding the balance at time two by taking the balance at time one, m accumulate the balance at time one, and then subtract off the payment. So I'd get a balance at time two would be the, the 510,000, the balance at time one accumulated by multiplying by 1.06 and then subtract off 25,000. I see that's 515, 600. I'm still in a negative amortization during the second year. And likewise, during the third year, I'd go through the same type process. And during the third year, or you know, at time three, I see that the balance at time three is actually 516,000. So it, it went up even a little bit more, not quite as much more. You see the, the, the payment amounts are increasing. And so I'm, I'm, I'm working my way out of this negative amortization. But even during the third year, uh, I'm in a negative amortization. And finally, at, at, during the fourth year, so uh, to get the balance, the fourth year would go from time three to time four. And, and at the balance at time four, um, going through this process is 512,000 plus some, some change there. And you can see, uh, oh, I've finally worked my way out of the negative amortization at time uh, in the fourth year. It took me four years to get through that. Uh, so in the fourth year, I've worked my way out of a negative amortization. Now the balances are actually starting to go down. Okay, comment that I wanted to make. And again, that sort of thing happens oftentimes when your payments are, you have payments that are increasing like this. Okay, so let's go back to the original problem, though. I want to look at the balance at time 10. And remember, generally, um, 
by the way, before I move on, I could have actually just continued the process that I just did. Uh, that would not be a very efficient way to get the balance at time 10, but I could have done that. I would have gotten the same uh, result that I'm about to do, uh, what, that I'm about to do now. So uh, let's do it more directly, the balance at time 10. And remember, there's a, a, a prospective and a retrospective method of calculating these balances. Now, prospectively, you, you have to think about what, are, what information do you, do you need? If I'm thinking prospectively, well, prospectively, the balance at time 10 would be the present value of the, of the future payments. That's prospectively, I'm looking forward in time. It's the present value of the, of the remaining payments. But I don't know that information. I don't know what's remaining. I just have this pattern of payments that has occurred in the past. So I should really be looking at a retrospective calculation of, of um, for, for the balance at time 10. Be more efficient to do a retrospective calculation. And remember, retrospectively, the balance at time t is the accumulated value of the loan amount uh, minus the accumulated value of the past payments. Take the loan amount, accumulate it to time 10. That tells me uh, how much I would owe if I had not made any payments, but I have made payments. I can see I've made payments, so I subtract off the accumulated value of those payments. Now, the accumulated value of the loan amount is the 500000 accumulated from time 0 to time 10, so I would multiply that 500000 by 1.06 to the 10th power. And now I'd, I'd subtract off the accumulated value of the past payments. So the past payments are those that are shown there, the 20000 at time 1, the 25000 at time 2, and so forth. And so there are several different ways. This goes back to now, uh, it boils down to being able to calculate the accumulated value of that arithmetically increasing annuity uh, there, that 10-year arithmetically increasing annuity with payments of 20000 and 25000 and so forth. So there's a couple of ways to do that. Uh, one way to do that is to uh, think of those payments. Just uh, I, This is probably how I would originally, this is how I would do it. I would peel off. Um, I see that the, there's it's arithmetically with common difference of five thousand. So I would peel I would peel off fifteen thousand from each payment, and then write the results. the The, the rest of the payments would be five thousand at time one, and then the ten thousand at time two, and so forth. That gives me the twenty thousand at time one, the twenty five thousand at time two, all the way up to the sixty five thousand at time ten. And if I would do it this way, then the accumulated value of those payments at time ten would be the fifteen thousand times an S angle ten, and then plus a 5,000 times a cap I S angle 10. So that's what I would get uh, if, I, if I reworked the payments uh, the way that it's shown now. The payments are originally this 20,000, 25,000, and so forth. I think another natural way to um, rewrite those payments is to uh, think of this as 10 payments of 20,000, and then the, the, the increasing part starts at time two and ends at time 10. You get a 5,000 at time two and then a 10,000, extra 10,000 at time three and so forth. So this is another natural way to rewrite those payments. And, and done this way, I can see the accumulated value of that increasing, arithmetically increasing annuity would be a 20,000 times an S angle 10 uh, and then a, a 5,000 times a cap IS angle 9 now. So uh, going back to the original payments, either one of those are, uh, uh, I think, natural ways to calculate um, the accumulated value of that, uh, of that arithmetically increasing annuity. And then, uh, so both of these expressions that I have are natural ways to me uh, natural uh, ways to calculate the balance at time 10. Go through your calculator. There's not really an... Uh, you know, you're just going to have to go through some calculator steps to do this, and you'll get uh, you should you'll get the same answer either way you do it. You get this 366, uh, 366,741.70. Okay, so that's one one uh, um, uh, example. It's a you know good example. Illustrates you know the ideas uh, with the uh, with the loans. And now let's look at a second example. Uh, in this example, we have a 10-year loan at a quarterly effective interest rate of 2% is repaid with quarterly payments. All right, the first payment is 1,000 and subsequent payments are 2% less than their preceding payments. Determine the outstanding balance immediately after the 25th payment. So I don't think you would want to do this step by step. You'd have 25, payment, uh, 25 steps, you know, uh, 
Uh, uh, and actually, uh, I, oh, there's some informa missing information there also. I don't even know what the original loan amount is. So let me draw the timeline first. This is this is the original timeline. And as I just said, I don't know what the original loan amount is. They did That's not given in this problem. And so I'm, I'm looking for the balance after the 25th payment. You can see what the pattern is on the on the payments there. If I tried to do this one retrospectively, remember retrospective, you need to know the information from the past, and I don't have that loan amount. So I'd actually have to calculate the loan amount first. And uh, that's going to be uh, difficult to do. That's, uh, let, me, let me think about that. It might even be impossible to do. I don't think there's enough information there. Um, no, there is. There's, there's, it's a 10-year loan. I've got, I could calculate the loan amount, but that's, uh, that's not, not going to be very efficient to do. So it's, uh, I would need that loan amount to do this thing, to do the calculation for cap B sub 25 retrospectively. But if I, instead I look prospectively, so let me move the timeline forward here. So at time 25, I look prospectively. It's a 10-year loan, so I know I've got 40 total payments, and that's what the uh, the future payments are going to look like uh, prospectively at time 25. And so uh, I've got all the information prospectively. In this case, I know how many future payments there are, and I know exactly how much each one of them is. And so I can calculate prospectively the, uh, the balance at time 25 by taking the present value of those remaining payments. So now this is another problem from, you know, uh, from module two, a little blast from the past for module two here. We're trying to take the present value of a geometrically uh, or a geometric annuity, an annuity where the payments are, uh, the payments themselves form a geometric progression. And so what I would do there is I would go through my process to value a geometric annuity, which is that three-step process, uh, value each payment at the valuation date. So that first payment at time 26, I need to take that amount and I need to discount it one period to get back to the valuation date. So I'd multiply that payment at time 26 times a V. And then the payment at time 27, I'd multiply by a V squared. And I'd do that, continue that pattern. I need to know how many payments there are. And I recognize that there are 15 payments there, future payments. So I'd have a 15 term expression there. And uh, factor out that first term, which is 1,000 times 0.98 to the 25th. The V is a 1 divided by 1.02. So I factor out that first term. And what I get then is, is this other expression. Um, in the brackets there, uh, the second term in the brackets, 0.98 divided by 1.02 is a, a number that's less than 1. So I think of that as, a, a, as my new V value. And so I, in the brackets, I get a 1 plus V plus V squared and so forth in 15 terms. And that's the VEP expression for an A double dot angle 15. And the interest rate that I would use would be that, that what's in the brackets there, the 0.98 divided by 1.02. I take the reciprocal of that and subtract 1. And at this point, it's just a matter of using your, your TVM buttons on your calculator to calculate that value. You get the 68.6807 number. So that would be the balance, um, outstanding balance on, of this, on this loan uh, just after the 25th payment. Okay, so a couple of good examples there. I think those were good examples, reminding you of uh, arithmetic annuities and, and geometric annuities. Okay, we'll do some more examples next.